Practice listening test for IELTS version 9, test 9. Instructions. You will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. Write all your answers in the listening question booklet. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section 1. Section 1. You are going to hear a talk by the course director. Look at questions 1 to 9. Now listen to the talk and answer questions 1 to 9. Good morning and welcome to the North East London Polytechnic. The North East London Polytechnic, which we often call is an NELP for short, is one of the 30 polytechnics in England and Wales. As you know, at a polytechnic you follow broadly similar courses of study to those at universities. Although many polytechnic courses are strongly vocational, that is, they lead directly to a career, and you may well spend a considerable slice of your time actually working on placement in industry or any other work area as a part of the course itself. Some of these courses are the so-called sandwich courses, typically two years, polytechnic study, one year in industry, and a final year back at the poly before your examinations. Another feature of polytechnic life is that there is a very large choice of courses. For example, at NELP you can study Manufacturing Systems Management specialising in computer-aided design or business studies with the option of adding German to the course. The Fashion Design with Marketing course includes marketing as an integral part of it NELP runs a unique BC's modular science course in which students choose a combination of subjects from the available options 11 in the first year alone. Entry requirements are often flexible. Many mature students find their work experience is rated by the admissions tutors as highly as if they were offered formal examination qualifications. If you want to choose your course you may discuss with admissions tutors or NELP courses. Careers advisory services and college career tutors are a tremendous source of up-to-date information. The NELP offers a much wider choice of courses and subjects than you may previously have considered. There is a large number of handbooks on the market available through career offices and libraries which are filled with information on possible areas of study and the NELP Information Office telephone 01597 6698 will also be glad to help with your queries. Now look at the school map. It is the green sheet you got when you came into this lecture hall. Have you found it? Green sheet. Let's look at this map. NELP is situated in West Ham on the borders of Stratford. It has a large campus. Please find the main building on the top left corner where we are in now. All the lectures of the courses will be held here. The students union is next to the main building. You will have to register in that building. Opposite the students union next to the parking place you will see a tall building. That is our bookstore where students buy the course books and some second-hand books. At bottom part of the map you can see a group of buildings. These are the student services blocks. You will find the students dining hall and the students accommodation there. NELP Library is located in a modern building adjacent to the bookstore. 
You will get your library card after your registration with your student ID card. Look at the top right hand corner of the map. The sports centre is located there. The gym is between the parking place and the swimming pool. Next to it, there is a recreation centre where students play chess and dance. There are three tennis courts next to the swimming pool. I hope the map will help you to know the campus. Thank you. That is the end of section one. Now you will have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Section two. You are going to hear a telephone conversation. First look at questions 10 to 15. Now listen to the conversation and complete the message. Ealing Health Centre, can I help you? Oh, good morning. I'd like to make an appointment for Mr Dan Gosnell today or tomorrow. He needs a cholera jab. Uh, sorry, what's the name? Could you spell the name, please? Yes, Dan, D-A-N, Gosnell, G-O-S-N-E-L-L. G-O-S-N-E-L-L. -L. Good. Who's, uh, Mr Gosnell's doctor? Oh, it's Dr Bentley. Dr. Bentley. Well, I'm afraid Dr. Bentley is not well himself. In fact, he won't be back until next week. Oh dear, well, it is rather urgent because he's got to go to India on Friday. Unexpectedly. Um, look, could he possibly see someone on Thursday? Well, Dr. Mayo, she's got two appointments available. There's one at 10.20 and there's one at 2.30. Oh sorry, what's doctor's name? Dr. Mayle, M-A-Y-L-E. Dr. Mayle, thank you. I think the 10.20 appointment, please. 10.20. Oh, he must bring his vaccination booklet. Yes, bring his vaccination booklet. By the way, how much is the vaccination? It's £2.80. £2.80, yes, thank you. I'll remind him all about that. Well, thank you very much indeed for your trouble. Goodbye. Goodbye. You're going to hear three students of English and their teacher discussing how they try and learn new vocabulary. Listen to the discussion carefully and tick the ways each student uses. Now look at questions 16 to 18. Now listen to the discussion and answer questions 16 to 18. Well, would you like to tell me something about the way you study new words while you are learning English? You first, Monica. How do you learn new vocabulary? I learn a lot of new words by reading newspapers. I look up each new word in my dictionary. I see. Eric, how do you learn new words? Well, I like reading newspapers too, but I don't use a dictionary. I can usually guess the meaning of new words. I also read sport magazines because I'm interested in sports and I can guess what the new words mean. Yes, I think that's a very good way to learn new vocabulary. What about you, Susan? It's different for me. I learn new words from TV and films. I try to figure out the word from the pronunciation. Then I look it up in a dictionary or ask my husband to explain. You are lucky. I haven't got an American husband. I think the biggest problem is remembering new words. I know I should keep a vocabulary book, but I'm too lazy so I don't. Well, I keep vocabulary cards and I write each word with its translation. Oh, I think it's better to write the word in an English sentence. That's what I do in my vocabulary book. And sometimes I group together all the words related to one topic, such as football or camping. 
that's a good idea. I used to try and learn ten words each day, but that didn't work. No, it didn't work for me either. You can't remember the words if you don't use them. I do a lot of crossword puzzles, and that helps me. I try and use new words when I talk to people or write to them. Well, it's quite an interesting discussion. Now let's talk about. That is the end of section two. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section three. Section three, you are going to hear a lecture about note taking. As you listen to the lecture, answer questions nineteen to thirty-two. Look at questions nineteen to thirty-two. Now listen to the lecture and answer questions 19 to 32. I'd like to welcome Dr. Norton to our series of lectures on study skills. And I must say, judging by the numbers of you in the audience out there, that is the most practical lecture we have had in the whole term. So rather than take up any more of your time, I'd like to introduce Dr. Norton. Thank you. I'd like to begin. By saying how pleased I am that so many of you have come to the first of our study skills sessions this term, today I'll talk about how to take notes. Note taking is quite an interesting topic to discuss. First, I would ask, why do you take notes? I think you might consider two reasons. First, notes are an aid to memory. Obviously, if you are reading for a long essay over a period of weeks, or for two or three essays simultaneously. Then you must have some system of sorting and recalling the information you will need when you finally come to plan and write the essay. Second, your notes provide the raw material on which your mind must work in relation to your set essay topic, and you will need certain types of information, such as facts, figures, and direct quotations. They must be available quickly and accurately. When you take notes, the process of doing it. Helps you to summarize ideas and arguments, select points relevant to your purpose, and finally understand and interpret the original source. So note taking is an important stage in developing your understanding of your topic. Your notes will provide the basis for your thinking and the materials for your essay. You may ask, when do you take notes? It really depends on your own purpose and the stage of reading you have reached. In your early stages of reading, when you are skimming material of a general nature, you will probably not want to make any notes at all until after you have finished your skimming and have got a feel for the subject. Then you may find it useful to go back and make notes on the points or sections within the general survey which seemed important to you. At a later stage of reading, when you can recognise to underline key points or make marginal notes. You will probably want to do this with essential source materials or original texts, which you must study in detail and refer to constantly. Now we come to the question: What do you note, and how much do you take notes from reading? We often consider the following three ways. First, what is the writer's intention in the passage? You know the writer has selected and structured his material to suit his intentions. But these are unlikely to be precisely the same focus as your essay topic. Therefore, while recognizing the writer's own purpose, you must sift his information and ideas according to your own interests. The same holds true for lectures and tutorials. And then, the discipline in which you are working. 
in disciplines in which you are working with original sources, for example, history or literature. You will have to include many direct quotations in your notes, as you will want to include some of these quotations in your essay. You must copy them with absolute accuracy. You must remember to attribute the work to the original writer too. In other disciplines, you will more often summarize passages in your own words. The last is your own purpose in relation to your essay topic. If your purpose is clear, you can select and record relevant material in as much detail as you want. Some students insist that they prefer always to take detailed notes because it's all so interesting, or it may come in handy later, or the book is the standard text and so it's worthwhile spending time on it. Well, maybe, but in practical terms, you seldom have time. Now, I'll deal with our last question. How do you take notes? There are three general principles that apply to all methods of complying notes. One, clear identification. Your notes must be clearly headed with all the bibliographical details you may later need. When you want to use these materials in your essay, in practice this means you must record the author, title, place of publication, publisher and edition and date. And next to each key point or direct quotation, you must note the exact page reference. 2. Flexible system. You should record your notes in such a way that it's easy to rearrange them for the purpose of your essay. Notes made on loose leaf paper and cards have the advantage that they can be shuffled, combined and recognised in the planning and writing stages of your essay. 3. Room for comment. Wide margins are useful. As you build up your materials, you will find you want to add cross-references to other sources. You may also want to include your own comments or reactions to the text, or just indicate that a certain point may be crucial to your essay. That is the end of section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 4. Section 4. You are going to hear a conversation between two mothers. They are discussing their problems of raising children. One mum is very conservative and the other one is very liberal. Look at questions 33 to 41. Now listen to the discussion and answer questions 33 to 41. Hi Katie, how are you? I haven't seen you for ages. Oh, hi Sally, pretty good. How about you? How's Jim? How are the twins? Jim's fine, thanks, but the kids are a bit hard to handle actually. What do you mean? Well, they were pretty easy to take care of when they were infants, but they are really starting to go a bit wild. I'm really hesitant to do anything drastic because I want them to be creative and free-spirited. So what kind of things have they done? Well, the other day they were both running around in the store. I told them to stop, and they did for a short while. But then they went at it again. Pretty soon John had knocked over a stack of boxes and Joe started stepping all over them. It was really embarrassing. Wow. That does sound like a tough situation. So, what did you do? Well, I figured that they were just being kids, so I apologised to the store manager and I left. I won't be going back to that store, that's for sure. What about John and Joe? Did you discipline them? Not really. You know, they're just kids. They don't really know better. 
Well, I hate to disagree with you, but I really think you have to teach them what they can and can't do. If you don't, you'll have a lot more of the same embarrassing incidences. I'm kind of afraid that they won't be able to handle a strict approach. They're so small. If my children are anything to go by, I'm certain that they can learn even from a small age. I remember when my kids were young, I used to go bonkers too. Then another mum told me I should set the limits, you know, like tell them what is okay and what is not okay. Then I had to be ready to enforce the boundaries, and if the kids were over the boundary, I had to be consistent in disciplining them. What exactly do you mean by disciplining them? Well, it depended on their age. When they were young, I would just restrain them for a while. As they got older, they had to sit out, you know, like away from everything that was distracting. And then I even had to spank them a couple of times too. Gee, I don't know if I could do all that. I really loved them too much to discipline them. Well, I sort of thought of it as this: I love them so much that I have to sometimes do the hard thing. I mean, it's no fun to discipline your child, but I know it will teach them the right way to behave in the future. So it's actually for their own good. Yeah, I can sort of see what you mean, but doesn't that stifle their creativity? That's what some people say, but you know, my kids are extremely creative. Remember when Samantha won the art prize in her school, and what about Jeremy, who won the prize for creative writing? I really don't think disciplining them has stunted their creativity. Hmm. You may be right. It sure is a tough thing to do, though. It must break your heart when you have to spank them. Yeah, that was one of the hardest things I ever had to do in my life. But after I spanked them once or twice, they really stopped disobeying me. It was pretty incredible. Oh, but. You know, when you spank them, you really need to sit down and talk with them first, and make sure they understand why you're spanking them. Also, they need to know that you still love them very much. And after the spanking is over, we always hug and kiss. Well, that's interesting. It certainly is food for thought. I'll talk it over with my husband tonight. Maybe we'll have to change our approach to parenting. Good luck. It's really a tough job, but it's amazingly rewarding too. Thanks a lot for your advice. Please say hi to your kids and David for me. Okay, and say hi to Jim and John and Joe for me. I will. Take care. See you later. Bye. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.